comes from the Gospel of Mark. Um, and, and this is one of the stories that's recorded in every, in every gospel. There aren't a lot of those. Listen for God's word to you today. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the first verse of, of the book of Mark. And when it says read a whole gospel over the week, this is the shortest one. <laughs> Just saying, Okay. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism for, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And I'm going to skip on to verses 14 and 15 and add those too. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I'm going to help you all by moving this to a place where I don't bump into it quite so much. It's sensitive. There we go. All right. Will you pray with me? Send your Holy Spirit on us today, Lord, that we would hear clearly what you are saying to us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our saying rock to us and our Redeemer. May the words of my mouth and Amen. the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Remember Lord, that you are dust, our rock, to us and to dust. And our may the words return. of my mouth and Amen. the meditations of all of These our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. These familiar words begin the truth. Remember that you are dust, us, our rock, to us. and to dust. And our may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be These familiar words begin the truth. Remember that you are dust, our rock, and to dust. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. These familiar words begin Remember that you are dust, our rock. In a season, the words of my mouth and the meditation. And of course, we are the Lord Christ begins. Remember that you are just in a season, the words of my mouth and the meditation. And of course, we are the Lord Christ begins. Remember that you are just in a season, the words of my mouth. Wilderness. So Jesus, as soon as he's baptized, goes out to the world. You are just 40 days where he does not eat anything. Wilderness. So Jesus, the season we celebrate actually covers. And that is because in the Roman Catholic tradition, Sundays are considered the season we celebrate actually because we don't fast. And so, um, so we don't count those. So we don't fast. Six of which are Sundays. That is because in the Roman And so, um, so we don't. Right. Focusing on fasting. Uh, which means giving up meat or certain foods or food altogether during these 40 days is a practice that may date back as far as 200 um, A.D. And uh, that's a long time ago. So why do you think fasting was important, why it was the focus of the early Lenten celebration? It has to do with the wilderness. I just said what it was. Jesus gave up food for 40 days, but... We mere mortals <laughs> thought that was a little too long. Uh, and so they gave up meat, right, um, which was the basic sustenance of those days. In the 11th century, the practice of receiving ashes began. And the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return, are included in the, the ritual of Christian worship, at least as far back as the 12th century. That's one of the oldest documents that we have intact. The ashes to ashes, dust to dust, as a reminder of our own mortality, comes from that passage I read in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And God says to Adam, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you will return. In the Hebrew tradition, putting ashes on your head was a sign of extreme penitence and sorrow. The Old Testament is full of examples of this form of lament. Uh, Queen Esther's uncle Mordecai covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. Um, the entire city of Nineveh, where Jonah went, uh, covered themselves in sackcloth and ashes. Nineveh repented when they learned from Jonah that God was about to destroy their city. Uh, and so this news was not good news, right? It was unwelcome. And uh, as their act of penitence, not only did they put sackcloth and ashes on themselves, they put it on their cows and all the other beasts of burden in their town. I wonder what the cows thought of that. I, I don't know, but they were, they were really, really sorry. So all of this is to say that when we participate in Lent today, we, when we participate in this ritual of ashes, we are joining with Christ followers from the earliest times over almost two millennia. And when we say, when we say those words, ashes to ashes, or remember that you are dust, it is no small thing to confess your sins, right? To say that you are a sinner separated from God and in need of redemption. This is at the very heart of who we are and at the heart of the gospel. Let me say to the kids, I meant to show you this while, while we were up. Um, we have ashes here in this little jar. And they're going, to, um, they're going to stay on our communion table all through the season of Lent. And if you would like to receive ashes, if you didn't get them Wednesday and would like to after the service, I'll be glad to, to help, help you with that, or you can put ashes on yourself. So today I'm beginning a sermon series, um, which is inspired by an amazingly insightful devotional book by Jill Duffield, which I was going to have here to show you, <laughs> and it's in my office. Today I'm beginning on, uh, this, this book called Lent in Plain Sight, a devotion through 10 objects. So this amazing book focuses on 10 different objects throughout the season of Lent. So some of the other ones are shoes and oil and bread and the cross. And we'll look at seven of those 10 throughout this season. Uh, and you've discerned already that today's object is dust. God's dust. This is not the dust that clings to the bookshelves in your home or in the dim recesses of your closet. That is a different sort of dust altogether, although it's the one we think of when we say the word dust. It's composed mainly of dead skin cells. Well, that's a charming thought. And uh, they've sloughed off and settled in the places that we generally don't give a whole lot of attention to. That dust is indeed dead and lifeless. But God's dust, the dust, and I use quotes around that, the dust that God scooped up and breathed life into, forming the first human beings, that is a very different sort of dust. So I'm going to read that passage again using the Common English Bible translation. On the day that the Lord God made earth and sky before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord hadn't yet set rain on the earth and there were still no human beings to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils, and the human being came to life. Did you hear anything about dust? No. So several, several weeks ago, I had the privilege of being in a workshop with the professor who translated Genesis for the Common English Bible. And he told us about how he struggled to find the right word to place there to translate the Hebrew word edamah. In the King James Version, the word is translated dust. 
And most English translations follow that pattern because they couldn't think of a better word either. God bends over and scoops up this edema, this dirt that is fertile soil and is yielding all these lush things in the Garden of Eden. Um, and then he breathes his ruah, another word that's hard to translate, which means breath or wind or spirit. He breathes his ruah into the edema and creates Adam, Adam. So in Hebrew, Adam is edema. It's a play on words. The name Adam isn't just some random thing that, that God names it. It means from that fertile soil. So in English, the word dust has become uh, synonymous with the dead stuff that makes our houses unclean, right? Uh, or at best, the dry dirt that sometimes uh, gets spun up in, in, um, in a dust storm, right? Or a dust devil, that, that kind of dust. But the dust in the creation story isn't dust like we think of it at all. It is that fertile topsoil, that damp, dark ground of potting soil and compost and humus, earth that brings forth life. And even as God condemns Adam, saying that he will once again return to the Adama because he's eaten their fruit, um, the earth from which he's formed, even in death, is life-giving. Now, John the baptizer, and you remember that John is Jesus' cousin, right? Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, gives birth to John, even though she had been barren forever, right? So now she's old and she has John. Um, Jesus, John's job is to prepare the world to hear what Jesus has to say. And he does this in a very curious manner. He goes out to the River Jordan. He wears funky camel hair clothes and eats wild locusts and honey. And he's strange enough that the curious uh, and even the cautious come from their dwellings in Jerusalem and surrounding, uh, surrounding dwellings and from their synagogues to see what this weird John guy has to say. Um, so this is his compelling message. Repent! Repent! Turn from sin! Turn to God for the kingdom of of God is near. Some of them were even baptized by John in the Jordan River. In Hebrew, the word for repentance means that turn away, make, you know, physically turn your body away from sin. Over and over, God calls people and even whole nations to repent. This is not new to the Hebrew people who have come to listen to John. So they're thinking, is he just yet another one of those prophets in a long line of prophets who's going to tell Israel, you got to change your, sin your sinful ways or God's going to punish Israel, right? That's a long theme throughout the Old Testament. But that's not, that's not John's message. God's messenger, John, adds the why. Why repent? Why change your ways? Because the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. God's promises of redemption are about to be fulfilled. I baptize you with water of repentance, says John. But one is coming after me who will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. I bet that caught their attention. And one day John turns from what he's doing baptizing in the River Jordan, and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there is Jesus. Wow. I sometimes wonder what I would have thought if I had been one of those people standing on the riverbank that day. Would I have thought John to be another crackpot preacher like so many I've walked away from in my own life, right? They're all over CW. Um, can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. You know, so, so I, don't, I, I, and I confess, I really don't give these people a whole lot of listen. Sometimes I do, but I don't. Um, so would I have walked away going, I don't have time for this? Or would I, would, I, would I have had the eyes or the heart to see the Messiah standing there, right there on the riverbank, 
close enough to reach out, close enough to touch. When I have seen heaven open up and the Spirit descend like a dove upon Jesus, would I have heard God speak those words, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved child. I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that I would um, have had the insight to proclaim Jesus the Christ right then and run right up to him and said, my Lord and my Savior, and followed him all the way to the cross and beyond. But I know I wouldn't have, right? We're no better than those first apostles when it comes to deserting Jesus. I know deep inside I would have been skeptical like the others. I would have been slow to believe, and when it really mattered, I would have run away. See, that's why I need to repent. I can't even begin to count the number of times that I have chosen my own self-interest over the way of the cross. The times that I have thought my problem's too big even for God at times. At times I have outright disobeyed what I knew to be the right way to live, God's right thing to do in a circumstance. Remember. Remember that you are dust, that you are Edomah. You are that fertile soil to which you will return. And that's what the Hebrew people did. Remember. Hebrews are great at remembering. Remember how you were slaves in Egypt. Remember how your ancestors wandered in the desert. Remember. Remember the Passover. Jill Duffield adds these insights. As the dust and ash is imposed on me, forcing me to see my myriad limits, I remember. I remember that I am surrounded by the household of God, sinners redeemed by grace but limited like me, but ever seeking to imitate Christ, however poorly. I remember that I am incapable of doing the good I know but I am forgiven anyway. I remember that repentance means turning away from myself and toward Jesus. I remember that nothing angers God more than a ritual of penitence unaccompanied by actions of love. Let me say that again. I remember that nothing angers God more than rituals of penitence unaccompanied by actions of love. I remember that this Lenten journey is not about only giving up something, but also standing up for someone. I remember that my years on earth will come to an end and that, God willing, my works will follow me. And that thanks to the journey that Jesus is embarking on in this season, I don't I don't need those works to save me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, oh blessed hallelujah. Remember, says Jesus, remember me when you eat this bread, when you drink from this cup. This is the joyful feast of the people of God, and they will come from north and south, east and west, to sit at table in God's kingdom. This is not a Presbyterian table. It's not, um, it's, it's not Stonehouse's table. It's the Lord's table. And Jesus invites everyone, don't sit down, Rob, everyone <laughs> who's, who trusts in him to share the feast, which he has prepared. And as we prepare to celebrate this together, um, we're going to sing a song that I personally love, but is probably new to you. Just stay where you are and wrestle open your communion elements. If you need another, take another so that we can share the Lord's table together. <laughs>